How's it going? So we're doing this as a webinar. It's a little different than um, the meetings. So you don't get to see each other, although we can pull, pull people up on the stage. Um, and yeah, excited to, you know, I think a lot of you know that um, we did some a lot of free programming back um, like three years ago. We did a, um, some solidarity series free programming, and then I did a lot on Clubhouse. And it's been a little while that we've been doing that. I've done some free programming, so excited to be here and um, you know have the initial free programming webinar with Aaron. Um, I think we we will learn a lot from him, and we'll just talk about neurodiversity. Um, I am gonna have this go live on Facebook because why not? Um, it's an important topic. So as many of you know, I'm Dr. Hannah. I work at Sound Mind Philadelphia, and we also have a training program that is approved by Oregon to train psilocybin facilitators. Um, one of, I think, still only four in the country, which is exciting. Um, I have ADHD and dyslexia and um, auditory processing disorder, if anyone cares. And uh, <laughs> Really excited to talk about um, how psychedelics have helped me and um, and bring Aaron on to talk about his organization and some of the stuff he's done, which has been amazing work. And um, yeah, and just answer questions and see where, where this takes us. So maybe give a little bio um, and I will let you screen share too, if you wanna screen share about your um, organization and then we can um, just like do what we do, you know? Sounds talk great. about things sounds great and we have like a, an hour here yeah yep all right awesome um well yeah I, i'll just kind of uh lead off with like i don't know maybe talk for about like five-ish minutes and try to just give like the quick summary and then i'd love to really engage in like more of like a dialogue with you because uh you know the first thing i'll say is that you know i've done i've done a lot of due diligence to put a lot of this information into like really accessible content that's already existing um so uh, first I'll leave with a little bit about me, show you a little bit about our website and how people can use that as an additional resource. And then we can just get to chatting because I think you also uh, have a lot of unique pieces of this kind of like neurodiversity uh, exploration of all of this. So, um, so as far as, you know, my sort of short bio at the present, uh, I'm deeply involved in the psychedelic space, especially as it like kind of enters this legal phase, which is exciting. Uh, I'm presently um, serving as a, an a advisory member to the American Psychedelic Practitioners Association, kind of speaking to the disability access and accessibility piece there. Uh, I'm also serving as an instructor for the Alma Institute's training program as well in Oregon. Uh, so I'll be teaching on the same subject as part of their requisite 160 hour online training. I'm also serving as a University College London co-author on a study for naturalistic uh, exploration of psychedelic use amongst autistic adults. Also serving as a co-author for a recruitment for a future University of Toronto study that will be exploring psilocybin in the context of treating depression in autistic adults. Uh, in addition to this, I uh, run the organization, the Autistic Psychedelic Community, and we co-founded co that three years ago. And uh, in the years since, we've run about 160 uh, online meetings. Uh, we run them every week, and I'll show you some of that over the site. I've also published three books on the subject, um, soon to receive an advance to write a fourth book very soon. And I think that's all. I, in addition to completely not related to this, I also recently released a uh, musical uh, composition album entitled Psychedelic Symphonies, which is designed to support psilocybin and LSD sessions as well. Um, and you can find that on like Spotify, et cetera, et cetera. It's called Psychedelic Symphonies. Anyway, that's a lot of things, but let me show you quickly around our site. Uh, for those of you guys, um, you see Dr. Hannah just put it in uh, the chat there. Um, but it's uh, designed to be pretty intuitive and really our site is more of like a through way. Uh, the whole nature of our organization is really predicated on community first. So uh, these top button sets here, as you'll see, like the first most first option here is that you can join our Zoom meeting that happens every Sunday at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern, 7 o'clock London, although daylight savings time happens. So I'm not sure about the London time right now. But uh, we do that weekly meeting, and essentially what we do is we just open up the room, we give people the opportunity to introduce themselves, to meet one another as autistic individuals, uh, and it's also open to any and all persons, professionals, family members, journalists, 
really whatever. It's a giant like open data learning center. People are sharing protocols, methods, uh, you know, bad outcomes, good outcomes, all sorts of things. And more recently, because we've kind of got a, a flood of interest, we've also spun off to have a non psychedelic version of the same kind of meeting. So people are just meeting as autistic individuals who are just seeking social connection and support. And so that happens in like a signal messaging group that we have set up. So if anyone wants to join that, uh, feel free to um, send me an email at Aaron at autistic and I'll be happy to add you to that if you want to kind of commune with other autistics in the world. Uh, we also have our books. Uh, I'll show you that in a quick second. We also have an online chat forum that's open 24 seven. We moderate it. So people from all around the world, it's about a thousand members now. Uh, so you can go and commune with those folks also anytime we have a podcast and additionally we have an online course if you at any point in the future want to support us you can also make a, a monetary contribution on like a monthly or one-time basis as well so super fast uh, probably the most uh, interesting things we do have like the book autistic psychedelic which is 50 people's stories from our community that we put together my original book, Autism on Acid, is also for sale as well through our site. And we have a third book, which is like my keynote presentation kind of condensed into a small information packet. And finally, if you're not already overwhelmed by all of this, which again, you can always look at at your own leisure, you could probably spend like three days straight on this site, just consuming like media and podcasts and documentaries and things. But we do also have this course uh, upcoming and it's designed for organ facilitators or even anyone who's just doing any work in the space uh, now or in the future. Um, it's kind of molecule agnostic. We're simply speaking about how to support individuals, kind of the current state of research and like forecasting where we're gonna go from here. Uh, if you look on the site, you can look at like the whole syllabus. We're gonna go over about 30 different research papers that are very relevant. If you look on like PubMed or Google Scholar, you won't really find a lot of uh, like autism and psychedelic overlaps, but you will find a lot of trait presentation overlaps, symptom overlaps, uh, and just information, you know, anything from in uh, the early 1960s, there was uh, a study that was, there's many studies that were done with LSD in the application of adolescent use, uh, it's highly controversial, highly unethical at that time. They didn't really know how LSD really worked and they were just kind of like shooting in the dark. Uh, but that was kind of the start of it. And in the years more recent, uh, there's been a lot of research just surrounding social cognition enhancement that's made possible by 2A agonists like LSD and psilocybin. And just a, a lot of other research that's also started to come about uh, related specifically with autism in animal modeling and soon to be in clinical applications, as I've mentioned. As of now, the only really strong and sturdy study that's happened in recent era um, with human adult autistics has been the social anxiety study that MAPS completed in 2016 with Alicia Danforth and Charles Grobe. Uh, and they got good safety and efficacy out of that. So we'll talk about all those perspectives. You can look over the syllabus. It gets super dense or whatever, but it's the first four Saturdays in January this year. And I'll also put it into the chat, but I generated like a discount code uh, for anyone that wants to enroll. It's a uh, sound mine 100 and you can Yay. just $100 <laughs> off the enrollment for the course. And because we also believe in open access as much as possible, it's also a sliding scale. So if anyone would like, I'll also put in a link for the scholarship application form. If you feel you qualify, just fill that out. Um, you'll be available, you you'll, may, may be eligible for full or partial scholarship because the goal is just to get as many people as possible into this course so that they can meaningfully collaborate on what is quite literally like a brand new branch of care. Um, so having a couple hundred people in this course is going to be in service to not only like myself of learning from all the different disciplines, but also to all the cohort, which can then kind of serve as collaborators because autism requires so many different types of specializations. Autistic populations also have so many comorbidities um, that, you know, we're, we're tackling like something that's approaching the complexity of like the whole of mental health. Uh, through some of these lenses. When you really dig into what autism really is and how it presents for us, it starts to very much resemble the same level of heterogeneity that you might see in the whole of the human population. We just have a little bit of overlap in terms of our social challenges, some of the other sensory motor stuff, but we can talk about that more so through like our dialogues here. So I think with that, I'll stop uh, inundating you guys with so much information uh, and invite you to simply check out our site if you want to uh, do that at a future point. And I'll put some of the information that I mentioned also into the chat if, uh, if uh, we didn't already put that in there. 
I'll put the discount code in there and just turn it over to you, Dr. Hannah, for wherever you would like to go from here. Wow, so many options. Um, somebody did ask about the captions and live transcript. I don't know why it's not showing here or even how to turn it on, except for um, it says somebody has enabled closed captioning so someone can see it. But I did put a link to Facebook. I just did Facebook Live and that just automatically does that. So for accessibility purposes, it looks like they're just a couple minutes behind us and they are transcribing more or less accurately. So yeah, okay. I think you can go there. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of ways we can take this. I think um, for me, it's, I think it's interesting just some of the first times we talked, just you telling, you know, the anecdote, I know that there's the research and I think that's really important. I, I also think it's interesting just to mention that the MAP study was very, you know, specific about not uh, addressing aspects that are uncomfortable with autism, but not curing autism, because there is a terrible history of like trying to cure autism in like psychoanalysis, psychotherapy, um, psychiatry. Um, so it's like the dark history of, you know, not acknowledging that this is actually part of someone, but there are many um, aspects like secondary results of having autism that can be um, addressed as a group. Like it is anxiety provoking to not be able to read someone's face very well, right? So, so I think just um, looking at what the outcomes are in these studies is really interesting. And I remember, I think Alicia was explaining that to me that she was very specific. Like we don't look at curing autism. <laughs> That's not a thing, you know? So we, this is how we framed it. Mm -hmm. um, but some, I, I think it's really interesting what you said about sometimes um, folks on the spectrum can go into psychedelic journeys and have like a moment of, if it's like a heart opener and pathogen that they can have a moment of having better ability to um, read emotions. Maybe it's not even through faces anymore. It's just like, you can kind of connect with the person in a way that you can't. And that part of your informed consent, I love informed consent. It's like my favorite thing to teach about, but part of your informed consent pr process is to help someone understand that you might have this window into another skill set that, that then disappears and how that can, you know, be really devastating to people because they're like whoa this is a um these these are data points that everyone else just gets daily and I don't get them and that can be like really um upsetting so mm -hmm. just would love for you to talk a little bit about that and um and just like what that's like um yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely and and you know like for context you know um at this juncture from where I'm sitting from you know I'm 10 years deep into doing this research I started in the underground with myself with friends with collaborators of all sorts and it's since gone above board and all throughout that time I now have like you know 5,000 or so data points whether that's a phenomenological report or a direct experience with someone in a session or all these things so I feel that all I'm really doing now is like telling the same knowledge I already have through like bar charts and line graphs and like you know peer-reviewed research um, knowing full well that this is already something that's has been going on for a long time continues to work for people is very reliable for a lot of people for some people it's like an irreplaceable tool in their toolkit. Um, and I think that that's really important to emphasize that like I didn't come to this by virtue of you know. Uh, co like coalescing a bunch of data or, or like kind of theories, this was like direct experience that I then reverse engineered uh, through a lot of this other kind of like meta analysis kind of research. Um, and with that context piece in mind, I can speak to, uh, although it's still in peer review, the University College London study, we did get the data set back, and Jack Stroud and Charlotte Rice were the primary authors on that study. We have, we helped mainly with recruitment, and also with some of like the language adjustments to make it kind of more, I don't know, accurate, or autistics tend to have a sort of certain like particular way of dealing with language specificity, and so we really tried to not make any questions uh, kind of difficult or ambiguous, and we really spent a lot of time on that. But when we got the data back, the really the short version of it was that if you didn't, if you took away the fact that we gave them the autistic quotient test, because the other uh, quotients that we gave them uh, were the mystical experience questionnaire and the challenging experience questionnaire. Those are two surveys that are often provided for general population studies and naturalistic psychedelic use. And when we did that, the mental health benefits that were reported back to us were very much could be generalized across the normal, healthy, typically developing population. I guess, I mean, autistics can also be considered healthy, but typically developing has like its medical definition. And so we saw things like improvements in like relationship to anxiety or depression or trauma healing or these kinds of things. 
So in some sense, we're expecting to see the same thing with the psilocybin study with autistics. The one thing that did stand out, however, is we clustered all the questions uh, into different kind of change metrics from like, how were you before? How did you perceive your own self-reported changes? And one of the strongest, most consistently reported and most like numerically improved in terms of self-rating scale uh, was a cluster of questions that had to do with assimilation. And assimilation is just kind of a fancier word for individuals wanted to be around other individuals, felt connected to other individuals, enjoyed being around other individuals on the other side of these experiences. And I think that that really kind of solidifies it a bit for me because autism translated through Greek means like the isolated self. And at the core of our mental health issue is the fact that we're lacking that connection because sometimes the sort of lag in our social cognition or the gaps in information that we're unable to access become because of some of these neurological processing issues. It results in what I sort of metaphorically used to describe as like being like a, a baseball player that keeps getting invited to play baseball but doesn't have any arms. And so it's like, what, for me, before I started psychedelic use, I sort of had given up on connection because it was just a challenge for me. It was a challenge. It was very cryptic. Uh, it was unclear how, how or where I was messing up the interactions that I was engaged with. And so just having a bit of clarity um, was really helpful. And, and something that's not often discussed, but is quite uh, well established is that autistics also have uh, 50 to 70% of us deal with a subclinical condition that's known as alexithymia, which is a difficulty with identifying or labeling our feeling states. This isn't to say that we don't experience like sensations within our body. It tends to be, at least in some circles, it's theorized that there's a hyperconnectivity at local regions in the mind. And the intensity of that processing might create such an overwhelm that we are more or less, it's like having 10,000 phones ringing, but we are, our selection of that stimulus is so overwhelmed that we essentially end up picking up no phone at all, uh, or we like dissociate or we kind of become like disembodied a bit uh, in our natural state. That's where you see people with like ear protection or like light filtering devices, things like this. That's just a matter of like our mind processing and, and being upregulated in such a way in certain centers uh, that again, we're, we're having difficulty kind of like seeing the signals in the noise. So. Um, one, one final thing I'll say in this little tangent, cause there's so much to cover, um, totally. <laughs> is that like something like LSD also is often associated with like consciousness expansion as though, you know, we're like amplifying this or that. Um, but a lot of, uh, you know, neural correlate data, in other words, like what is the constellation of the movement of, you know, um, connectivity throughout the mind and brain imaging studies is also revealing that there's a lot of downregulation of those local regions. A classic example of this is like the default mode network being a local region that gets downregulated. That, that, that network also implicated in some autistics, which have, we basically always have to say some because it's like so varied. Um, but if indeed an autistic individual has what's known as like aberrant default mode network activity, in other words, it's upregulated and stays in that narrow band and rarely down regulates in a sort of like attentional switching mode like a typically developing person when engaged in a task will become less ruminatory and more like kind of engaged in that sort of mode of attention um, but that's where you also see some of the overlaps begin with the adhd uh, challenges as well with attentional switching it's it's as though autistics live in a mentalizing space and embodiment becomes a, a naturally difficult um, sort of state of being which then leads to some of these kind of social disharmonies if we don't know really how we're feeling or what like the general vibe of the space is that's where we get some of that dissonance and some of that like dropping the ball or you know being blunt when we could have been softer or just kind of missing a little bit of the backing rhythm of like the the situation we might be in so take all of those into account and it seems quite clear to me how these things are working for those of us in our community and i see a number of people from our group present here in the audience too you know, for us, it's like as basic as like Newton getting hit on the head with an apple, like knowing that the apple fell, but we're in the process now of deducing like what's the mechanistic theory of like this autistic processing and how is that interacting with these substances. But even if we don't get to that level from a direct experiential level, like we have all the kind of evidence for our own personal experiences that we might need that we feel we are experiencing an enhancement under the influence of these substances, especially even just in subtle doses. That's probably the most common use amongst our community because the higher doses tend to play out 
kind of similar to how a general population might utilize it for consciousness exploration, spiritual exploration, going very deep, or in the case of MDMA, accessing really hard to access parts of maybe trauma, walled off memories, things of this nature. So <clears throat> I'll just uh, take pause there and realize that I always tend to speak in monologues because we have to architect so many different things to get yeah, do you feel so you feel like the microdosing is more unique benefits to the autistic community as opposed to macrodosing kind of has similar storylines as yeah, not, I th yeah, I think at a certain level, like let's just take the hypothetical that maybe this default mode network activity might be, you know, hyperactive in a in the case of um, an autistic, or maybe it's aberrant or it's like locked in in that range. If that's the case and other individuals are more able to like kind of automatically make that switch it might be and it was for me it was a dramatic brand new experience to kind of drop out of that mentalizing space and into that deep embodiment state whereas others might be more accustomed to that maybe they just get a slightly more exaggerated experience of embodiment whereas they're normally more embodied like it's a so to go from like zero to something is quite dramatic for us yeah um and I, and it, you know, that's how I experience it from an experiential standpoint. I, you know, if I take like 10 micrograms of LSD, I've essentially like turned the ruminatory radio down in my mind and I'm able to just like, it's basically like six hours of meditation. And then I'm in that kind of calm center. Uh -huh. um, but it's not, it becomes impractical if I'm taking like high doses to try to function in the day to day, uh -huh. like uh, that's gonna, you're, there's already evidence showing that like general, lots of different kinds of cognition falls off in terms of it's like your effectiveness, your performance, uh, things of that sort. So yeah, I think it's just unique in that way. Um, and something that I like to highlight because of how much of a challenge it is to see a roadmap towards you know, take home medicine. I think I saw on the first, there was one company in Canada that was looking at PTSD using a, a take home psilocybin model. That's like the first I've ever seen. We're actually just going to trust people with these materials out in the wild. <laughs> but obviously, like in the underground, okay. uh, in like the, you know, the history of these substances, that's, they're very commonly used. We were, I was just at this conference in Miami and there was, you know, 2000 people. I'm pretty sure there's probably less than four people at that conference that took these drugs legally. Um, like everyone else is getting access from some other way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I advocate for just leading with education, allowing people to have access because it's quite expensive if you just are going to like a center to do a microdose, like, mm -hmm. and we're charging yeah. and billing for that level of a professional's time, that's gonna be really unsustainable for individuals that use these more as like dietary supplementation, like mm -hmm. having yeah. a, a little bit of like a serotonin boost uh, that like, that's basically how I interpret it to be like, this is like a subtler drug to me than like coffee or something, yeah. Um, yeah, totally. like at those dose ranges, so. Yeah, and I think that, um... You know, I think I find the idea of using because we're we're doing using ketamine and sound mind, which uh, most people know. Um, but just the that there have been benefits with ketamine and OCD and just like perseveration and how often that can be a component of other not just OCD but ADHD people often are like perseverating a lot. It's like why is the same thought happening over and over? And I think in autism too. So it's like there's certain psychedelics or I guess you know, what we're considering psychedelics or certain um, molecules in the, in what we're now terming the psychedelic category um, that can be beneficial for certain things. So I think for me, ketamine does amazing things for suicidal ideation and for perseverative like looping. And people are like, whoa, I just got, you know, some people have every journey is different, but some people are like, wow, I just got a rest from like my racing thoughts for the first time in my life, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and it's, and I find the overlap of dyslexia, ADHD, and autism. And like, there's so many papers about how many traits are overlapping, like the um, prosopagnosia, which I totally have and can totally offend people is like not recognizing faces. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not terrible. It's not like Oliver Sacks level that he can only recognize his family members, but it's, it's like pretty bad that I'll see someone that I've had long conversations with and not, it's not that I don't remember their name. It's that like, I don't register their face. Um, and it can be really, super stressful you know it's a if you're like oh am I supposed to know this person how um especially now that I feel like a lot more people know me so being you know teaching the class and just doing conferences and it you, it'd be really great to be able to keep faces straight um mm -hmm. but I think that the that the um there's like this um 
there's this like anxiety loop that happens if there's certain things you can't do. And then you're like, oh no, why couldn't I do them? And then it becomes like perseveration that's the problem. And then, you know, there's different ways that we can get people out of them. So I have been approached by by parents of autistic kids and thinking about, you know, what what is the age that I would feel comfortable? And I think it probably teen, actually there's a question in the chat from Stephanie um, about adolescents. Like I, I would feel comfortable with adolescents. I don't think it's like younger kids, you don't totally know if the, it's affecting their brain in ways you don't want if it's growing um yeah, yeah. and and yeah. i can speak a bit to that as well because yeah. it's i mean the, like the three questions i commonly get when people come up to me at a conference are like and and i think firstly i think it's interesting that we so strongly associate autism as automatically equaling children i think that speaks to how invisible the adult population becomes when services drop off and yeah. we struggle yeah. economically academically a lot of us just end up living at home with parents or living in social services housing and like that all has to do with this sort of disconnection piece as well. Like, it's not just like that word lonely, it's that loneliness means you can't get helped into employment. You can't navigate social hierarchy in, in a workplace, all these factors, but the current state of things, there's actually some studies slated for, I think like three to seven year olds for ketamine uh, for like self injurious behaviors. Um, so they're gonna like look at safety and efficacy through that window upcoming. Um, and then there's a MAPS PBC study that's going to be, I think, with war trauma victims with MDMA and teenagers. They're basically like, if you're if you're shook from a bomb blowing up your family and you're 14, they're not going to make you wait until you're 21 to like reclaim your life. Basically, they're like, well, this is worth discovering the safety at, at this level. We understand the drug from like a neurotoxicity standpoint really well. We just don't understand the developmental having a longitudinal follow up in that. Mm -hmm. um, and anecdotally, again, like everything we do is research and harm reduction oriented. I'm in no way like encouraging anyone to do so. I just like from these 5,000 reports, I have heard from a number of parents who have used like psilocybin microdoses with their adolescents as well with success. And some of the some of the outcomes are quite remarkable to me in that, you know, some of that self injurious behavior is a good classic example. Like parents went from they were using cannabis or cannabis oil to sort of like deal with that restlessness or just the general like activity to calm them down. But what they really seem to report when they started to utilize uh, psilocybin or like lion's mane or other kinds of like stacks, uh, people were reporting that like the most profound story that I heard was like a parent who had never really been acknowledged like throughout in their entire kid's life had never really like locked onto them and like really had like a shared moment of shared attention. And they reported that like during that experience, they weren't necessarily verbalizing, but like their kid met them with a certain kind of like fixation that they had like normally their kid just chases whatever shiny thing it is or any number of things. And in that experience, like there was like a very like fixed and like locked experience where even without language, there seemed to be like a meeting of like that awareness within that experience. And they saw the same stuff in the LSD studies in the 60s. But again, it's like, it's an incremental thing and you have to have longitudinal follow-up. So realistically, from a clinical standpoint, it'll be like a decade plus before we're really meaningfully penetrating that layer of access for people. But, you know, enough case studies come through in the same way that CBD oil has been pushed into, you know, like the eight to 12 year old range for individuals with like epilepsy and things. You know, if quality of life is really being compromised and right to try and consent mm -hmm. is present, you know, ultimately these things are, I feel like it's almost more of the choice of like the family than it can be almost like of the, like you're choosing quality of life, not just for the child, but for the whole family unit at that level. Like yeah. these certain mm -hmm. presentations can be exhausting, but it's never been the leading edge of my work or this community organization to really mm -hmm. focus on adolescent or a child or anything like this, because it's just, we're already in a sort of gray area, a controversial area, but I, I just, I, I believe that the research will continue to move in that direction. If, if you're seeing efficacy in adult populations, uh, you're just going to have to, you know, untangle what that means in the developmental window, if that's going to be a factor, how that works. And that's, that's definitely beyond my knowledge. I mainly have just been a collector of stories. I'm far from like being a, a pharmacologist or something like this. Yeah, and I would just say as a physician that I don't, I can't think of anything that's like neurobiology that would make it a bad thing to treat a kid. I would just say it's, I think it's more a question of informed consent. Like at what age can they really understand what's going to happen and make the choice? Yep. Um, and I think that still becomes an issue in your community. If people have, you know, if they have, 
um, like uh, lower levels of understanding, which most most autistic people don't. Their IQs are are not lower. But if someone is like not actually processing language mm-hmm. um, as part of their autism, it's hard to really know if if they're consenting fully. Um, so yeah. I think that's I, I know you've talked about that too. That yeah. you, that's why you have to you have to limit sort of the population that you're working with, which I think mm-hmm. is, you know, we'll learn more about con- consent, I think, as we continue on this path in the ecosystem. Yeah. And I think even furthermore to that point, like um, if it was someone that did have any sort of like language challenge in that, I think that it would be especially troublesome to engage that individual in any sort of like high dose psilocybin or LSD because of the inability to process a very strange experience that might come up for them. Um, You know, I, I am fully able to articulate as best I can some of these experiences. And I came into incredible challenge um, trying to integrate some of the experiences in more high dose sessions. So I'd be very wary of someone who's unable to process ver- like even if it's verbally written yeah. whatever it might be if there's no means to make sense of that experience like and when people do ask me like they're like my kid is turning 21 soon like in a few years like maybe we're thinking about using some of this to kind of help them to heal from a really difficult adolescence uh, my first thought always goes to like perhaps you could consider looking into like mdma therapy it tends to like have less surprises and has like a much safer like just experiential feeling about the whole experience. Like you're given like a fear reduction, you're given like a sense of safety and comfort by the substance itself. Um, And I think that, you know, honestly, like for anyone that could pass a medical screener, again, I'm not saying like everyone needs to do these things, but I would have a thought that like it's at the youngest, safest point that someone could look back at their childhood with a little bit less fear and a little bit more self-compassion from like something like MDMA. Like we all, like Dr. Dr. Julie Holland always says like every child has trauma, period. Like you get left alone in a room for an hour and you're like, why did that happen? And all of a sudden it's like shaping the rest of your life. Yeah, like, yeah, totally. Uh huh. So yeah. I think we're just learning about like how we can kind of do these kind of software updates with these substances. Or like mm-hmm. if you take what like Galdolin's talking about with like uh, the critical learning windows and that, then you just get into like super interesting stuff as far as like mm-hmm. you know, how much can we kind of you know system update using using these tools over time mm-hmm. um, yeah yeah so we have another question um chris is asking i've wondered if the research on trauma and people with autism has a strong connection i've noticed a lot of stigma towards mental health and people of color are often not diagnosed i guess with autism yeah. or with the mental health issues have you noticed there's a diverse ethnic group in these studies and i'd also say that when I was doing work with dyslexia, I, it was like very hard, even on the standardized testing to figure out, um, uh, when some, like, is this person an adult dyslexic or were they just in not a great school? So they never really learned how to read, or is it like a, they're, they're also all normed on white people's dialects. So it's hard to know, like, what is just a dialect difference. So it's, it's super hard. Um, and I, I got into some of that research and it was just almost impossible to, figure out so yeah, yeah. curious and, and and a few other thoughts on the trauma overlap as well I, don't, I can speak a bit to the population stuff we saw in our UCL data at least as well um, but with, with the trauma piece I think if you look at like a PTSD screener let's say you check like you know 90% of the boxes you test in the PTSD range if you then basically overlay those same trait presentations into an autism diagnosis you're like 89% autistic at that point you're reclusive you're avoiding social interactions you know, you're, you know, you're engaging in like maladaptive, like coping mechanisms, like there's all sorts of things that present very similarly from someone who is like, you know, you can become very shy or not so social if you're dealing with like kind of like the the post aftermath of like a traumatic or like a, a complex PTSD case, especially. And again, we mentioned like all children have trauma, so to speak, all autistic tra- children probably have even more trauma from being othered, from being shamed, from being kind of predisposed to being at the bottom of the social hierarchy like that was me I was bullied because I didn't understand jokes I didn't even understand when I was being bullied like it's like it's just everything set me up to just really become distrustful and I think I see that a lot in our group and we see that a lot in the in the work is that a lot of the healing is simultaneously healing our you know ability to have like self-compassion for ourselves to forgive ourselves for like oh I did miss that or like you know I got diagnosed and 
in my case, like I didn't like being labeled disordered and I thought I was like cursed forever. I never, there's so much emphasis on the things that I couldn't do. Like no one gave me a survey at the same doctor's office that was like, let's figure out your talents. It was all just like, here's what you can't do. Go home now. Yeah. I and totally so, talk about the trauma of being diagnosed. It's so traumatic. They like take yeah. away all of your compensatory strategies and they're like, do this. And I had, I, I was diagnosed when I was like 34 it was like, I got this. I got into medical school. Like, this is not, this could not be real. <laughs> like, I was terrible at so many of the simple tasks. Mm -hmm. um, but you just learn to compensate in ways that, that like, you can hide it and you can, you know, do it this way and do it that way. But if they strip away everything and they say, I'm going to tell you a story, now tell it back. Or I'm going to, you know, read words with noise in the background. You'll tell me what words they are. You, then you realize, oh my God, I've been... I don't actually distinguish these words. I'm like stringing together sentences rapidly trying to figure out like what makes sense in what order because they actually aren't individual words that make any sense to mm -hmm. me. Um, but I think that a bunch of things you just said are, are so interesting because um, I think to me, neurodiversity is like becomes a, a PTSD picture with like all these micro tra traumas and it's like micro traumas socially and then also um like uh, sensory micro traumas of just like you thought you saw something that's not actually what happened and it's super confusing it's like wait I just witnessed a thing that wasn't actually what everyone else saw because you're actually processing it different and I think yeah. that processing uh difference is traumatic you're like why how did how did I miss that thing that's so obvious to this whole room so I think when we do treat um, people with neurodiversity, we're often treating what ends up being um, like many micro traumas that add, add up to a bigger trauma. And then you're actually just kind of treating PTSD. Um, and when I, I started receiving psychoanalysis four, four years ago, when I started training as a psychoanalyst, or I guess five, so I was going four times a week for psychotherapy before I was doing plant medicine stuff. And um went in thinking like this is like my trauma is dyslexia and like the ADD and everything's just like doesn't make sense it's so hard to like it's so much more work for me to make sense of the world and I really thought that it would be that wouldn't actually be the story that I could discover like oh it's all these other things but it actually ends up being the story it's this, it's like a main part of the story mm -hmm. and um and I think part of that is what has now started us on this project about peer support mentorship. So we're doing at our CAP clinic in Philadelphia, we're working to train peer support people that have identities that match the patients that are getting treated. And then once they're done getting treated, they can get matched with someone else. And it's partly that like, it would be amazing to be treated by someone with dyslexia. So you don't have to explain that to them. Um, and I think same thing with autism, that it's like, there's not going to be that many autistic people that are going to get through these like long facilitator trainings, maybe some will, but, um, but I think there's, there's other things they can do to like be there for each other to, to help through the process of healing, you know? Yeah. You know, and that's where, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll avoid talking about Colorado for the moment because it's complicated what's going on there. Um, but I, but I can also speak a bit from some anecdotal experience, you know, I, we we had a we had a group retreat that we did uh, in, a, in in the Netherlands in Amsterdam. A, a group of us went, and I wasn't like the healer person. I wasn't the therapist person. But we went. We all were able to just go and purchase like truffles containing psilocybin legally, and we went as a group and we sat as a circle and we like supported one another in a very like mutual peer support sort of context. And I think that there's room for that and or the organ model will potentially allow for that. Um, like there's certain like if you take this dose amount, you need to stay for this amount of time or it needs to be this ratio for uh, the supervisors on site and things. It might not be cost effective for like the license centers. I'm not sure how it'll all play out just yet. Um, but for the sake of just kind of, uh, you know, looking and dreaming forward of what's possible, I think that that was really effective for us, not only because, you know, we were able to do it in a sort of cost effective way or an accessible way or like a very easily repeatable way. Um, but also because I think there's a there's there's something about the ability for an individual when they're in this open space when they're in this like I have access really to how I'm deeply feeling whether I'm upset or I'm happy, whatever it is, not only that, but I think a lot of us tend to get a little bit more and this has been validated in Katrine Preller's work and a Swiss neuroscientist, our effective empathy is, is greatly enhanced this empathogenic effect as well. And so to me, it's a bit troubling or not troubling, but it seems less practical to be in a setting where I might be engaging with a therapist, wherein 
there's healing to be had from taking a vested interest in the therapist and their inner world and having that mutual exchange of care. Uh, and like as a therapist, you're disallowed from really divulging. You can't be like, oh, I can relate. My wife at home is love. like there is none of that, like yeah. kind of mutual compassion exchange. Um, and that can be maybe sometimes frustrating in situations like I think someone like socially, socially weird for people who don't really understand the context of psychotherapy. I mean, mm -hmm. I think there is there's reason, like theoretical reasons for it. As a psychoanalyst, I would say it's really great if you can have not a complete blank slate, but someone that can be transferences can come out that you're like, oh, you're reminding me of my dad. You know, if you, if I, you, you knew too much about me, I might not remind you of your dad anymore, but it's really good. Like, let's figure out why I'm reminding you of your dad and play that out. That mm -hmm. could be helpful. But I think for us, that's why we're designing this peer support model to have a therapist that is more like you can map on your patterns if you need to. And then someone that is actually there to share experience. And I yeah. think then it becomes, you have to be just a little careful that you don't overly um, map each other, you know, say like, I was that exact same trauma. And then you're yep. not actually going into your own body and figuring out where it stays. Um, yeah. But I think that's part of the training, you know, that you're there to support, but not like tell the other person's story. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think it's, it's super interesting, like the healing. And I do think what you mentioned at the beginning, like solo journeys do have their place. You know, I think it's just the, what worries me is the, you know, people that haven't ever done psychedelics get a hold of some massive dose and think that they've read all these studies and think that they're just going to go take it. And, and that will happen with them. Yeah. Mostly what happens is they just like things get uncovered and they have no one to talk to, and that's not yep. optimal, but um, definitely yeah, there's a definitely. room for that. I know that Hanifa and Josh said that they get quite a lot of calls actually on Fireside's hotline. I think for that same reason, it's individuals that are so isolated that they're, you know, they're going out and they're seeking these substances like online or whatever it is. And then they're going through this experience like fully unsupported, which is just so not optimal, um, like whatsoever. Yeah. Um, and, and, and on like the flip side about the balancing out point to this is that I've also heard from members of our community who sometimes, you know, because of, there's this thing called like the double empathy problem in, in autism theory, which is like sort of this possibility that autistics are sort of perceived as being kind of like unempathetic, un un but that might be resultant from feeling things so intensely that they like dissociate from that input. And so sometimes I hear from individuals who are like, I can't be in an energetic container with anyone when I'm this open. I don't care if they're like a squeaky clean therapist person. Like I go so fully into their being that it's like, I feel like infected by their psyche in a, such a way that like, I need like a totally like open space, like maybe like an adjacent person monitoring in like a nearby area. Um, but having that possibility of really having that like kind of intimate self ceremony could be a possibility again still having like somewhere where you could be like EMTs are adjacent to like a facility room or there's like video monitoring or something that could be layers of protection um, might still be in service in a future model like I think we start from the most safest most clearly directly supervised models but for those who want to have some flexibility like I did a lot of my work in my own container uh, like at least with LSD sometimes it caused me confusion when I would go into that like everyone is one kind of state. It was hard for me to do self-work if I was like halfway inside of someone else's body, <laughs> like being like, uh, I think we're like kind of a conjoined organism in this moment for a second. Like it becomes a little bit harder to maybe work on aspects of narrative and those like kind of higher dose sessions. Um, I think, yeah, I think that's like, true. I also think, I, I guess for me, it's when I think about um like the ketamine work oftentimes there's an opening like there's a window open into the unconscious or into your traumas and if you're alone and I think you can kind of absorb like safety or you absorb um the care of the facilitators and I think sometimes at home you have this window and you're actually just absorbing the aloneness you know, they can actually enhance the feeling of being alone, even though you're like, whoa, I swirled around in the universe. Um, sometimes it, people have really deep experiences, but I, that's that's the one thing that I worry about with some people, especially if they've had traumas that are around like abandonment, they'll yeah. go into these places and they'll be like, oh my God, where is somebody? So we do like very rarely, we do home sessions for people once they've been doing in office sessions for a mm -hmm. while. And if there's the, like their story fits with that being beneficial, you know? Yeah. 
No, definitely. And again, like I, I emphasize like the, the, the exploration of a diversity of models, the testing of those models ongoing and starting from the most like supervised, tightly controlled models and like validating like the basic safety. Um, like we're going to get more information from a year of Oregon operating than we could in like 20 years of clinical. Uh, and we're probably for better or for worse, we're going to get a lot more adverse outcomes in Oregon because it's going to be a lot less tightly controlled as far as who's going into session, mm -hmm. you know, like that's going to happen. And there's adverse outcomes in medical practice every day uh, for all sorts of treatment. Um, and so it's going to be a real effort to speak honestly about some of these adverse events that will come up to also contextualize them and recognize that again like how many adverse events happened yesterday with alcohol in the usa or whatever it might be um we can con like tightly control but we have to also be prepared and, and that's something we haven't touched on but i think is really important is that a lot of the work that i'm involved with now is is focusing in and zeroing in on is an autistic mind any more contraindicated for psychedelic use most most especially with like the like lsd or psilocybin kind of category because we do in certain again it's like how do you slice the group sometimes we do see elevated rates of schizophrenia psychosis like symptoms uh, within autistic populations versus non-autistic it's like it's a matter of it being like one percent of the general population versus like two to three percent of autistics so if you're talking like a 97 percent chance of a non-adverse outcome for a treatment resistant kind of condition I would still be taking some of those chances if I was like at the end of my rope trying to navigate things. But again, like with something like MDMA, that's a lot safer of a starting point for the, any of those concerns. Because um, I've heard them. Like I think it's important, and we're finally at the point now where where we can really like emphasize that there are bad things that happen. People do have lasting like physiological or psychological damage that can come up. Oftentimes, it's because of mishandling during the session. A lack of preparation, naivety to the substance, not disclosing conditions, not knowing family history well enough, mm -hmm. any number of things. But nonetheless, there's always risk. Um, and, uh, you know, the work with UCL, we didn't see anything in the naturalistic data that indicated that this population needed anything different in terms of medical screening that like the general population would really need. So like we don't just like throw out like the caution we've already kind of come to understand. Um, it's just like, you know, it's I'd like to learn more and more about that. And I think the study that Compass is going to do where they're doing the mechanistic study next fall is really going to also reveal like a lot more, not, not just the mechanisms of like the psychedelic action, but it's going to reveal like probably some subtypes of like serotonergic processing within the autistic group versus the non-autistic group, which will be like a really novel insight that we haven't really captured before um because that's what they're going to oh, do they're yeah. going to give them psilocybin put them in a brain brain imaging scanner and then also have them engage in social tasks to measure their performance improvement with psilocybin so mm -hmm. like that's essentially like the raw mechanistic data that would really validate a lot of my like narrative storyline about all this i experienced that enhancement i had the suspicion that it had to do with like this sort of global connectivity going like more online like that down regulation in some of those local centers, if they can really capture that and validate that, then like that to me is like even further uh, of like a reinforcement that there mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, some some very hard uh, neurological basis for for some of these outcomes that we seem to see so reliably um, in the population. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, and I think that there, um, I guess I would, I just wanted to add uh, if people have, there's always some people that are like, I don't believe in diagnoses or I don't believe in labels. And I think that that's a va valid. And when I talk about neurodiversity, I talk about it, that it doesn't necessarily have to be seen as pathological, but that it's a certain type. It's like a mm -hmm. type that's common. Um, like these commonalities in this group. And I think for me, I, I think it's really hard because, um, you know, I think if you know when you're young, like you did, then you kind of feel these barriers. I didn't know. And I think it's um it's actually interesting because people with dyslexia often are like get feel very discouraged about how hard things are. And people with ADHD, there's this thing called positive illusory bias, in which kids, um, have you ever heard of that? No. Kid, no. Kids with ADHD are asked to like do a task and then rate their own performance. And 
they uh, on average rate their performance much higher than it really is. <laughs> so they're like, I did great, you know? So I feel like I picture myself applying to medical school and just being like, I can do anything, you know, even <laughs> though like everything's upside down and backwards. Um, so, you know, I think it's, I think there's these benefits and drawbacks to having a diagnosis. I think for me, I might've realized like, oh, I should tell someone, you know, that I'm staying up till 3 a.m. in high school or like 2 a.m. to do mm -hmm. homework that should be easy for everyone, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that would have been helpful to be like, whoa, this isn't normal. This, this isn't what everyone else is doing. Maybe I should think about telling someone so maybe I can get some accommodations and not have so many questions yeah. um, or something like that. But um you know, then, then you start getting a storyline that you can't do something. So I think that's the drawback. Um, and I also, I, th I also think interestingly, um, the two, the, the two other positive things I think are that you get to be introduced to your community. So I think when I got to meet other people with dyslexia, I was like, whoa, or with yep. ADHD. And actually when I was, I went to the director of, um, of the ADHD clinic at Penn. And I said something like, well, I have dyslexia. And I think I have dyslexia. They diagnosed me with ADHD. I think it's not right. <laughs> he like laughed and he was like, really? And I was like, yeah, because now, now that I've worked with ADHD, I, I can, I can tell without even doing a questionnaire, really. It's like how tangential someone speaks and, you yeah. know, what the, just the, their like cadence of speaking can tell you a lot, but he thought it was interesting that I was like, I don't, that's not me. Yeah. So he invited me to sit in on the adult ADHD clinic. And I was like, these are all my people. They're like the artists in West Philly with tattoos. And, you know, it's just like, I love these people. They're like my, my brothers and sisters. Um, so it was really amazing to then they, uh, he allowed me to screen all the ADHD adults for dyslexia. And there's actually quite a high number that are undiagnosed. It's like 30% overlap. And dyslexia isn't something most people see. The ADHD is something you see. You're like late. Everything's all over the place you interrupted, you know, so that that's what, that, and there's a, you know, there's a drug that makes a lot of money if you have ADHD. So there's not much like adult diagnosis of dyslexia going around. Mm -hmm. um, so that was really fulfilling just like doing that. And they've now implemented that in their center. Um, but I think just the concept of like, it can be a type, but doesn't necessarily have to be considered pathological. Like this isn't wrong. And in some version of the universe in which we're all like hunter gatherers, this was beneficial, you know, to have these different types of minds, but we have created a world in which this is a certain way we're supposed to function and mm -hmm. it's harder. Um, so just to mention that, and then also to mention, this is kind of a side note, but I, um, it turns out that uh, you can't really ask for accommodations if you're a medical student or resident, um, because there's like this caveat in the ADA that says if if the um, if the employer is nervous about patient safety, they don't have to do anything. Like they can fire you, they can not give you any accommodations. So um, I started a Facebook group called Adults, uh, sorry, Physicians with Dyslexia and ADHD and other neurodiversity, um, and it's like blown up. It's like hundreds of people. And my message is kind of like, talk to each other, figure out the accommodations that you can like make for yourself, but don't ask for them. And it's, it's a weird message, but I think just being, you know, most people when they, even outside of the medical profession, the more people I talk to, the more it's like when, when you ask for accommodations in the workplace, it's often like seen as, you know, legalistic and people start getting nervous and then everything changes and people think you're being weird. So um, I think it's just to be cautious about if you get a diagnosis and like how you're going to move forward with it. Yeah. And I want to like, just, you know, everything to, like, as you were, as you were just speaking, it's like so many of those points, I was like, Ooh, I want to talk about that. And then like, you covered, <laughs> you covered so much of what I already kind of like had in mind when you, when that first topic came up, I, I, I like top it off with like a few small thoughts of, uh, there was a really great essay that I read that got published recently. It was like a neurodiversity framed essay about this concept called like biological illumination. And it was rotating around that idea that like, if you don't pathologize it, it can be an opportunity to, it's basically like a personality test. And then on top of that, as you had mentioned, it's an opportunity to further connect with people who can understand your challenge, work through your challenge. And in the case of our group, What's really unique, I mean, I literally didn't know a single autistic person before I started this project. Now I know like 10,000 of them. And the reason why is because that stigma is real. The, uh, you know, the judgment is real. The lack of understanding is real. Um, and it's amazing when I'm at like conferences and stuff, how much people just like 
tell me everything about their life just because I did it first. Like, just because I stepped out and was like, hey, I'm autistic. And they're like, oh my God, I, I, so am I. You know, that thing that happened like that. Like, I'm like, yeah, I know, I know. Like, so we're going <laughs> through like, and I think like a lot of us have this illusion because we're in a classroom. We think, I think a lot of us grow up thinking we're the only one that's like this. And we, and like, it reinforces like a further delusion that like everyone else is 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 somehow the same and we're the, we're the outlier. And that's couldn't be further from the truth either. And so like, it really, it takes a more like mature, like, you know, interaction with more complex layers of people. And it requires like a very open discussion from every side of that circle too, to recognize and realize that like by, you know, it's the, the sort of classic phrase that I will utilize often is like, it's not like treating others as you wanna be treated. It's finding out how others need to be treated in a custom way and then exchanging that information so that like the harmony isn't coming out of like mimicking the same behaviors. It's coming out of like making very custom adjustments that work in like a harmonization, even when like the actions don't look the same. And like mm -hmm. in our group meeting space, it's a perfect example. It's like, we have people that are like unable to process audio information. So they're only ever reading the transcripts or they're only ever typing. Or we have like, you know, there's people that come from other countries where we're translating the like the transcript in like in Google Translate, copy paste back and forth, whatever. There's all these new layers of technological accommodation. And that's part of like what we're trying to train for these centers too is like, when you have your telehealth sessions turn like try to try to have transcripting if not inform your individuals that like hey you can use now with technology it's like you can use like your phone as basically like a closed caption device everywhere you go now with like like otter and other kinds of softwares that will just like live translate whatever you're or live transcript it whatever you're hearing like those can be really useful for individuals like we have I, I've done that myself, like when I'm at conferences, I'll like hold it up as like a second screen to sort of be able to like reprocess the information from like a red text based perspective. And it really does help me or the ability to go back. And mm -hmm. some people even it, even in terms of like working memory, they have this like, ooh, ooh, I have a great thought. But if they don't immediately type it and then like it just gets like lost downstream for them. So mm -hmm. yeah. we try to like also adjust that as like a social norm. I mean, I don't know, we at the same point, we don't really meet in person. Sometimes I wonder if we had like the same like 100 people group in an in-person meeting, like will we all be overwhelmed? Like we can't mute each other. We can't, <laughs> we can't adjust the lighting of our screens. <laughs> like we like Zoom is an incredibly supportive yeah. environment for yeah. sensory issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and and like, I, it, same thing with, um, so in the ADHD clinic, it was like everyone's getting Adderall and benzos and it's like, I, I was like, what is going on? They're like, oh, there's, even if someone's not on Adderall, it's usually, it's usually a heavy anxiety component, you know, of just like mm -hmm. sensory. And there was a debate whether it's like, is it just regular old anxiety or is it, is it like ADHD specific sensory overload anxiety? And I think they're a little different, you know, I don't think they're mm -hmm. actually um, the same, but they can both be true. You can like, you know, it's just like steroid, you know, corticosteroids, you cream, you can put it on anything and it works, you know, it's like, I, but I do think that, that there are different qualities of how the, like the sensory overload feels and how you address it. And then how you like create ceremonies that address um, the sensory needs of people. Mm -hmm. um, I do I, a bunch of things you said, I, I kept thinking of responses to I do think that the like the internalized bias of people with neurodiversity is really severe and I think if I can get like anyone else on board supporting dyslexia and ADHD except for the people that have it themselves because there's like I don't, I don't I want to know like you know because uh, you know how hard it is and you try so hard to cover it up that then you meet someone else and you're like oh they know how I like that I'm covering these things up you know, it's hard to, it's hard to mirror that or to come out. So I think it's really important as like a, they call it hidden disabilities, right? That you come out and like talk about the the struggles. And I think especially there's, you know, a, a lot of times people, people like me would like never tell anyone until I'm now like, oh, I'm successful enough that I can tell people. And then, yeah. then you get, you get the sense that like, oh, everyone with dyslexia is successful, but no, the ones that aren't, aren't on stage telling you about it, but they're still yeah. ashamed, you know? Yeah. And, and um, and sometimes it feels a bit like autism is to uh, autism is to uh, some other conditions as maybe psychedelics are to other perceivably like harder drugs. Like we have people that come to our group also who have like BPD, schizophrenia, and they're like, this is the only place where I can just talk about this. And I don't feel like I'm going to get institutionalized, like uh, anything like, mm -hmm. and, and that's a very serious thing. Like, like a super, a 30 
second story, there was one person that came to our group. She was institutionalized until she was 30 years old because she was schizophrenic. She said that she was experiencing de demonic voices, demonic visions, like waking, like full blown hallucinatory experiences. And so anytime she would talk about that with her family or with medical professionals, they're like, here's a benzo, here's like a tramadol. You're not seeing that. That's not real. And so she's stuck in between like a living hell and like being incapacitated in a medical model. Yeah, yeah. And her sister eventually like uh, got some sort of like custodial care of her. And they, this is like, uh, this is a story for a totally another day, but they went to Oaxaca and they worked with a Mazatec lineage practitioner there. And the shot and the, that Mazatec indigenous practitioner was one of the very first people in her whole life was like, oh, you're seeing and hearing like bad spirits. That's that's I, so do I. Let's go. Like and so they like work together from a space that was like understood from a more wisdom tradition kind of perspective. And she said that she like ran into the darkness that was inside of her and like ran through it and like emerged like in some sort of way, whereas before she was just tamping it down or like just being in like further dissociated states and like the her, her previous care. I'm not saying that like, if you're schizophrenic, take mushrooms, but like, it's, 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 a, it's a demonstration of like the way that we relate to like these other states that like we treat them in such a way that we're making medical professionals more comfortable being around these individuals or other people, but it's not always necessarily in service to like helping the person move through that uh, challenge and just creating at least, at the least we can do, um, I'm, for the least, what I would hope to see is just, a, you know, that if autism is sort of coming more further out into the light or all these things. So I think social media has also created a nice mirror for people. I think the number of people that probably got diagnosed by TikTok is probably like massive, like, or like whatever. But like, I think the same should be the case for, you know, like schizophrenics, people with BPD, these other very highly, highly stigmatized conditions. We ought to make a safe enough space just so that they can articulate their experience so that we're not just having this like re reactionary responsive like relationship to these individuals like because like they like it, it only compounds the issue if you're having something that you're trying to navigate and you can't even talk about it that's just mm -hmm. gonna that's setting up like such poor outcomes for these people yeah um, and I, I also think that having community is like where you can share the ways that you're dealing with things and it's like it's the most obvious yet I, I think like the least talked about aspect of psychedelics like what we're doing is reintegrating ourselves into community we're all lonely and we're all like depressed because of covid and we're creating systems that could potentially like bring us back together mm -hmm. um I have a cousin who was diagnosed with autism very late like age 40 and I like it came to me one day I was like oh my god my cousin's autistic that's why he's not just weird he's like been he, he doesn't understand social cues and I always sort of got that I'd always be like okay this is when you have to leave you know I'd have to because he, he wouldn't get the social thing cues um from anyone and I think he'd mm -hmm. come to me and be like what's going on I'm like you have to go there you have to... and it's like oh that's so obvious after becoming a speech pathologist and then a neurologist and that you know it's like now psychedelics I'm like this is so obvious but I said to him I was like you know you keep quitting your job because you get into these weird social situations and you wouldn't understand them and you just quit because you just it's hard to figure out what's going on I was like what about a script that says like I'm autistic. Sometimes I miss social cues. Could you let me know if I just missed something really obvious or that there's something you did that I should have understood that I didn't? And he's like, oh my God, I never thought of that. You know, I was like, yeah. can you no, try that's... it? Because like, I think you're like, you know, pissing people off all the time. And you don't even know why. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think, I think you bring people into community and they're like, this is my script or this is how I deal with that situation. And then suddenly it's not so bad, you know? Yeah. And then and you that's... take psychedelics and it's like, it's, you know ah yeah, so, great. Um, <laughs> that's, so great i mean that's where i think you know i think that that i i think in the same like that should be like we should have like sex ed like drug education we should also have like consent based training in like all adolescent learning like basic consent of all sorts like basic direct like accommodation request scripts and things like this because one of the nicest things you can do for an autistic person rather than be like oh you're autistic i'm gonna treat you like you're rain man now or i'm gonna treat you like that one person i saw on television or my other cousin that's autistic that is doesn't maybe even have, have any presentation similar to yours like it's really just like creating that dialogue and inviting that person to be like is there something i can do to support your unique learning techniques your unique processing your unique sensory needs is there something that i can do or is there something in this environment that i can adjust that will make you more comfortable um because it can also be a matter of us being 
uh, understandably hesitant to initiate those dialogues, but inviting autistic people in as an as an ally can be can be a really uh, appreciated and really valuable thing uh, as well. Like and just honoring the individual and their uniqueness in that same context that can be like tremendous, um, like really tremendous uh, as like one of the nicest things that we can ever really receive. And and I've gotten better at that also. Like I'll just I'll have times where I'm like. Hey, I'll be like, I'll be in a room full of people. I'll be like, Hey guys, just so you know, I'm not going to talk for like two hours. It's nothing personal. I just can't talk right now. And I'm just going to like go into like my mode. It might seem weird, but like, let's have fun with it. Here we go. Like yeah, whatever yeah. it is. And like, once you make the clear distinction of like, this is the new context we're existing in. It's like, you're just changing the game for a second. But if you can let people know what that game is, what you need, that's like the whole process. Like, it's just, you know, and the same would go for like, if you were in like a psychedelic session, like if you, I was in a group session once doing psilocybin work and I became radically aware that like, I was probably looking very strange to everyone else. Like I, I probably didn't look comfortable to the people that kept checking on me because I was like in like these very like stimmy sort of movement kind of positions. I was like very balled up or like, I would go back to like when I was a kid and I would really like compress myself and do these other things. And I think from the outside, it looks like I'm going through some terrifying experience, but like internally, I'm You're like, like, I'm so cozy. Yeah, I'm like self-soothing <laughs> myself. Like I'm like rocking and writhing and everyone's like, Aaron, are you like having a seizure? What's going on? I'm like, no, like I'm in like a pure like joy state right now. I literally said that. I was like, no matter how it appears, unless I like raise my hand and say actual problem, there is no actual problem going on. Just yeah. please trust me. I need to do this for my own like self-comfort in this, in this moment. And I did like I reconnected like I did like when I was a kid, I would always hand flap all the time. And just doing that when I was in this like psilocybin state, I was like, that feels really good. Like, I don't do it. You're like, why did I stop doing that? Just because yeah, like, it looks, really, it looks really bizarre to the outside. But yeah, like yeah. it does. Like if you do that, I don't like there's got to be something. It like feels like the blood just kind of circulates better for a second. Or I get a little mm -hmm. like tingly thing going. I don't know. I don't know what it is. Yeah. But like I definitely remember having that bully. It probably, br it probably brought you back into your body a little bit, right? Like It is. You get it's like an ecstatic dance kind of yeah. thing, yeah. you know? Yeah. Like you see people like at like a festival environment when they're just like really lost in like the movement of it all. And it's basically just like self-regulatory like movement movement somatic work whatever you want to call it yeah um, i love that yeah so anyhow uh but yeah we're we're a little bit past 7 30 i know we were yeah, going so we're going to jump into uh, the alumni room um for anyone who is an uh semi alumni member we're going to jump into a different members room um this is a trial we'll see if it, if it's fun um and so the you can find the link in the slack and anyone else that has I know there, there was one question that went unanswered too, actually. Is there good research on ketamine and youth above 13? Not that I know of, but there will be soon. And then is there a place for using psychodrama um, with plant-based sessions? I think there uh, is. I don't know of any work that's been done, but I think it's um, uh, I think it, it's an interesting thing that would probably work. Um, so... Those are my not very great answers to the last two questions, but um, we're around. You guys can, anyone can find us at, um, at info at soundmind.institute if you need to find us and you can find our website and we have a training and we have free stuff like this. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and we're, we have something coming out on um, this peer support model. There's a NBC is covering a veteran that went, is going through treatment with us. Um, so that's going to come out on Friday on Veterans Day, but we're hoping to replicate this model in not just veterans, but neurodiverse folks, queer folks, and BIPOC folks. So um, stay tuned with that, and maybe Aaron will be involved. It would be really cool. And um, check out Aaron's uh, site and offerings at autisticpsychedelic.com. And um, there's this scholarship thing that I can, um, I'll post on, actually, you know what? I will post it on the Facebook link too, because um, now it's on Facebook Live. We'll post it under there. And um, it was awesome talking to you. And thank you for your work. Yeah. Thank you for like continuing to do it. When I think at the very beginning, no one was really paying much attention, and they're like, "Wait a minute, what are you doing?" You know? Yeah, so. I, I didn't. I didn't really know. I mean, we created this project because there wasn't much information, and now you know, it's what the most special part has been not only just creating it, but like co-creating it with so many people. I think it's really enhanced the understanding in a way. Like the internet is so magical for 
really getting so many people of disparate to like knowledge bases into like one space so easily. Mm -hmm. It's like, I, it's, I, this sort of work would have never been possible like a decade ago um, at all. Um, and it's so cool to see it unfold. So, and, and I thank you also for, for, for imparting a lot into this conversation as well. We could talk for the, about this for so long. Days, uh, tangential so, yeah, conversation that goes on for like three days. Uh, so, and so do, do we just remain here in this No, we, go, we, then, like... we close this out and then you go to the other link. Okay. So we'll see good. some of you in a minute and others of you, we hope to see you at the next uh, free webinar in a month. Sounds good.